Hello and welcome to this NDTV exclusive. Just a few weeks ago, Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressing the Indian Science Congress said that we want our scientists and researchers to explore the mysteries of science, not of government procedures. Which is an interesting starting point to a discussion on whether the increasing red tape in the interference of scientific research in institutions and the declining funding to these institutions is a matter of concern. And who better to give us an international perspective on that than Professor Eric Lander, who's a mathematician turned biologist turned geneticist, one of the leaders of the Human Genome Project, and also someone who's been on uh, President Obama's Scientific Advisory Council. And he, he's here in New Delhi. Welcome. Well, great Lander. to be here. Lovely to have you. Um, in the context of, uh, of the idea of public funding to science and scientific research, which is, a, as I said, a matter of concern here in India, and I'm sure in the US as well, uh, the Human Genome Project, which you led, was a, was a good example, wasn't it? Where a coalition of countries came together to pour billions into essentially mapping the human gene. That's right. I mean, the Human Genome Project is just a marvelous example of the power of science both to unlock ideas and also drive industry. It was a collaboration between primarily the United States and the United Kingdom, right. together with France and Germany and Japan, and even China came in at the very end with, with a contribution to the project. And in the U.S., we've now noted that the, the United States government invested a little more than $3 billion in that wow. project. But an economic analysis showed that the return on investment was about $140 to every dollar invested. It's a pretty good return on investment, That's 140 to 1. And you see it all over the U.S. economy, all over healthcare. Hundreds of drugs and cancer are now based on findings from the genome. It's, it's just a remarkable thing when you unlock with basic scientific investment all that knowledge, and then it goes to, to drive healthcare and industry. Professor, in fact, if you could explain that to us in, in simple terms, that uh, the Human Genome Project has actually helped to target diseases like cancer more effectively. How, how exactly, I mean, where do we stand with that? Well, sure, when, we, when you use the word cancer, it sounds like it's one disease. But in fact, cancer is a whole host of different diseases, many different ways in which the cell can go wrong hmm. to start growing. So even in lung cancer, there are many different types of lung cancer. One kind, about 10% of all lung cancer, has mutations in one particular gene. And if you treat it with a particular drug, it responds. Right. But the other 90% don't respond to that drug. And then there's another 10%, and there's a different drug that's been developed for it. In theory, understanding all of those genes that drive cancer would allow people to develop drugs and target them to the right cancers. So when the Human Genome Project read out the sequence of all the three billion letters of human inheritance, cancer researchers could then start working to say, which ones are wrong, which ones are mutated right. in this kind of lung cancer, that kind of breast cancer, that kind of brain cancer. And it's provided a whole roadmap for a generation of drug developers coming, coming along now. So right, so until uh, those findings came to light, the, the common way of dealing with cancer was basically it was virtually like poison, just poisoning well, the cells. What did you do? Cancers were cells that grew too fast. Right. The traditional treatment was give them cell poisons. The problem was it was a very, very, it, it still is used a lot, but it's a very ineffective way to do it because you're using drugs that, that are almost lethal to the normal cells and just a little more lethal to the cancer cells. Right. Instead, knowing the genetic defects of the cancer lets you have precision-guided missiles. Right, it's, it's more targeted. It's much more targeted. But again, just to put this in ordinary terms, that can this actually help find a cure for cancer? Are we moving in that direction? Of course we're moving in that direction. It's not, though, that we're going to wake up on some Tuesday and have a cure for cancer. It's that for a skin cancer, melanoma, hmm. it used to be that, that, um, that a malignant melanoma would be just lethal. Right. But now drugs have been developed where it makes the cancer just disappear, although it comes back in maybe a year or so. Yes. And so people are asking, now, is there a second drug I can combine with it and mm. another? So it's going to be incremental progress, but over a course of a couple of decades, mm. we're seeing remarkable changes occurring in our ability to target and treat and see responses. I mean, you'll remember that when HIV mm. uh, first came along, it, it was a terrible plague. And anytime people used a single drug, 
patients sure. would become resistant very quickly. So you had to always find the yeah, next and the next. Except then when there were three of them and they were combined, that triple drug therapy now is enough to control HIV in most patients. Okay. That's what we're really looking for in cancer is the right cocktail of drugs targeted to each patient. And what sort of time frame are we talking about? Well, look, I mean, actually reach that point. Uh, you know, Hard to uh, say. Industry, Wall Street, would love it to be next year. But I look at it as a scientist and I say, if this is a job we can get done in the next two to three decades, that is for our children, so that when they, God forbid, need cancer drugs, we have that whole armamentarium, that'll be a historic thing. That'd so be I look huge. At, is that, is that a realistic huge. time uh, line? I, I look at it as a time frame 25, 30 years. And that would be an amazing achievement to get to that point. And will it cure every cancer? No. But let's, let's take the goal of half of cancers are treatable by that point. I don't think that's a crazy idea at all. No, that, that would still be extraordinary. But I actually read an interview of yours where you expressed concern that that goal would only be possible if the sort of funding support that the Human Genome Project continued, but that actually is increasingly on the decline. Well, this is a very serious issue. All those predictions about what we could do for our children's generation depend on being willing as a society to invest in basic, fundamental, world-class research. In the United States, I've been concerned that our budgets for biomedical research have been declining over the past decade. Yes. They're about 25% lower when you adjust for inflation. That's quite a sharp dip. Well, that's a huge dip. But then, you know, look at a country like India. Hmm. You ask, relative to what the United States spends on biomedical research, what should India be spending? So let's adjust it for the fact that GDP is different in India. Yes. And the population is different. Yes. If you multiply by those numbers, India should be spending three times as much in biomedical research. As it does currently. As it does currently, adjusted for its GDP. In fact, just in terms of the real numbers, uh, the, the figures that I got, and, and perhaps you might have uh, even more updated figures, is that we only spent 0.9% of our GDP on scientific overall. research overall. That's overall. right. Biomedical Whereas the United research, States is three times as much, 2.7, 2.8% in the United States. Japan is 3.4%. That's right. And even our, our global share of research and development, I find, is only 2.7% versus right. US 30% and China That's 15%. But, but so. I, I like the number you quoted. Percentage of the GDP that you're investing in science and technology, which is the seed corn to drive forward the progress of the country, 0.8%. It's, half, it's less than half of what China is investing right now. Hmm. It's less than three times, what the, three times less than what the U.S. is investing. And so if you're asking what is going to be the engine of both healthcare progress and scientific progress for the next generation, and what's going to be the driver for industry, it's that investment. Yes. And if India is, I mean, I'm concerned that the U.S. has dipped. But coming over to India and looking at those numbers, it's even more. I mean, India has a tradition of brilliant scientists. I mean, we, many of them come to the United States. We get the benefit exactly. of, of a, what we call brain drain, which has you know, been a problem since the 70s, The, the drain 60s, coming 70s. to the United States is much appreciated. We appreciate all the amazing Indian scientists. So we know that with Indian education, it's possible to do great science if you invest in it. So I'm, I'm curious during my visit here to find out more about the decision not to be investing more heavily in it. In fact, you, you mentioned in that interview that this is a crucial time to actually step up the funding for uh, research into, into the human genome because you're, you're poised at a very critical juncture. Well, and the opportunities... And rapid strides be, uh, made. Absolutely. The opportunities have never been better. Before, say, two decades ago, before we had a human genome sequence, it would take forever to find a single gene. It could be five or ten years' work. Now that we have all this information laid out, research can go so much faster. There are so many more opportunities to do things that directly impact medicine. So it's very frustrating when there actually isn't the support, the federal support, the United States government support more generally, to attract this new generation. Because if the new and generation doesn't come in, yes, you're, you not know, you're not going to get any of that. And is there an interest, though, in science and science education amongst young people in the States? Are you seeing an, an oh. increase? or? Uh, in terms of numbers and talent? There is tremendous excitement about what's possible with science and technology in the United States. Wow, really? I mean, well, you look at, at you know, what information technology has wrought. Yeah. Silicon Valley and people yeah. realizing that you can start an internet company for one one-hundredth 
of what you used to have to have as resources to start a company. Sure. And in biotechnology, it's plausible to start really small and clever companies doing things, and you're seeing just an explosion of creativity. And that's just the industrial side. So much of science is just driven by the curiosity of the amazing mysteries mm. about life that are getting unfolded right now. We can read out the history of evolution. We can read out researchers at my own institute, the Broad Institute, have now been reading out the, the ways the genes are turned on and off in individual cells. A single graduate student was giving a talk where he was saying, I can look at 10,000 different separate cells in a single day. And so we're able to see these mysteries about the, the kind of the atlas of all the different cells in our body and how they respond to different things. This is the first generation to be able to see all those things. And I think young people realize the amazing and exciting opportunities. That's, that's incredible because in India that's the other problem, that there's actually been a decline of interest among students in doing scientific research. The focus, the shift is of course much more towards IT. Mm -hmm. That's an mm -hmm. area. Or of course then there's the, you know, the other avenues of uh, financial sector and so on. But, but just in terms of an interest, in terms of the numbers of people actually enrolling, uh, that's on the dip. And that may also be because as you were pointing out, the funding isn't there. So well, if young people get the signal that this isn't something society values, they're they're pretty smart and they figure out that's not where I should be investing my life. I think they come in wanting to work on the most important scientific problems, the things they'll be most proud to tell their children someday they did. I think we feel like that about the Human Genome Project. Right. But then if, if they look and they say, look, it's too hard to make a career in this, I'm not going to be supported, then they go off and do other things. So your advice to, to India would be, number one, to just invest more. Well, that's certainly an important part, is to invest more. You have to invest smart. Right. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, you should in the long run be tripling the investment in biomedical research, tripling the investment in, in S&T generally. But you don't do that overnight, hmm. because you have to spend it wisely. It's got to be merit-based. You've got to have great institutions that really get to control their destinies. And so, but, you know, who am I to say? I'm just visiting, but, sure. but I would think that India should be thinking about the trajectory over the next decade of how it brings itself up to, to the goal that it should set to be a world-class power in science and technology. And also, I, I, I read somewhere that you said that it's also important to fund ideas that, that may not work. You need to take that risk. Oh, look, if you only fund safe ideas, you never fund breakthroughs. And this is something people just have to understand. And it, it's probably uncomfortable for a, a government, government minister to, to think about how he or she is going to ever explain I invested in some project and it failed. But think about venture capital. Mm. Venture capitalists, when they invest in companies, know that some of them are going to fail. In fact, they, it has to be because it's about taking risks. So much more is it about taking risk in basic science. You, you have to explore lots of directions and you've got to be brave enough to do it and know that many of those roads are not going to be productive. But some of those roads completely change the world. And that's why we do it.